Uh, hello everybody, thank you for joining us today for our Australian Australia and New Zealand trademark update. Uh, speaking today is myself, uh, Jack and Shannon um, from our um, trademark law, law and trademark team at Griffith Hack. Uh, I uh, practice, most of you might know me already and I practice um, in uh, with a specialty with branding and uh, trademark enforcement and working with me is a senior associate Jack Collings. He also does trademark enforcement and ownership IP advice and uh, Shannon Fardy will be talking as well this afternoon uh, today um, and she handles a lot of uh, trademark prosecution in Australia and New Zealand. She's qualified in Australia and New Zealand and also has an uh, extensive international portfolio. Uh, so what we want to do is go through some recent cases that have come up in the last year and just highlight um, some of the things that you should be aware of with protecting uh, non-traditional trademarks. They're becoming more popular these days and have a look at a comparison between uh, Australia and New Zealand and what differences you can expect um, for if you're, if you're filing or uh, have proceedings in those countries. So. Um, With the, the first case I'd like to talk about today is South Corp Brands and Australia Rush Rich Winery. There are actually four respondents in that case. Um, one was a, a Chinese firm and there were some other uh, companies. And it's of particular interest because it involved Chinese character marks. So the case concerned Penfolds Wine. Most of us are familiar with Penfolds Wine or at least those of us who like wine are familiar with it. And they had, uh, and the case involved an infringement here in Australia and they have registrations for penfolds and that's quite an old registration. You can see the numbers there aren't very many. There's only five digits, but that's because it was registered in 1923. And then they also had trademark registrations for the word Ben Fu, which is how a Chinese or Mandarin speaker would um, pronounce the word penfolds. They can't exactly pronounce penfolds the way we would because of the linguistic differences and they um, don't normally pronounce L. So it sounds more like Ben Fu, uh, and then the Chinese character mark, which is the translation. And they had those three registrations um, in class 33 for wines. And they commenced proceedings because Australian Rush, Rush Rich Winery and um, the Chinese company and some others were involved in using these Chinese character marks that are on display now. Now, for those of you who can actually speak Chinese or Mandarin, you'll see straight away what the problem is. And for those of us who don't know how to speak Chinese or Mandarin, you'll probably be sitting there looking at those pretty pictures, wondering what it's all about. Now, if, you, if you're quite sharp, you will have noticed that on the first slide, I had that um, third registration there for the Chinese characters. And you'll see that um, the first one, first dot point there is identical. And going down that list, you'll see that that mark actually is in all five, although sometimes it's at the beginning and sometimes it's in the mark. So even under Australian law, if you were looking at this, um, and you were comparing the Chinese character mark to the Chinese character mark, it'd be identical. And you probably say, what are we, what are we having a case about this for, Kelly? Um, and perhaps also those other two. But what's interesting though, is the finding in this case that the trademarks, these character marks that I'm showing you now, um, infringed not only the Chinese character mark owned by Penfolds, but also the other two word marks, Ben Fu and Penfolds. So, um, we'll have a look at how the judge actually arrived at that decision. It was um, Justice Beach, who's quite a good judge. Um, and he, there were a couple of, um, there were some background facts that he took into account. Um, in, and he said that consumers of wine in Australia include many Mandarin and Cantonese speakers. I think it's fair that uh, maybe all, con there's many languages, but he was able to identify that Mandarin and Cantonese speakers also like wine. Um, that, that it was of particular relevance that the um, word penfolds cannot be exactly replicated in, um, in f f by Chinese and Mandarin speakers. They say something closer to Ben Fu. And the character mark, the Chinese character mark is pronounced as Ben Fu when they read it. Um, there were some other data given to him during the proceedings uh, around um, the fact that uh, for us, people who are Australian residents um, and where they were born from originally, first is English people, then there's um, New Zealand people, and then the next biggest group is Chinese people. And we have a very big influx of Chinese people um, and Mandarin speaking people as tourists into Australia, or we did pre-COVID-19. So 
all of that was taken into account by his honour to say that uh, the market that we have here in Australia does in fact have people who can speak um, Chinese and Mandarin. And so when, when he looked at these marks and he said, well, we need to um, go through our Australian law, but how does that apply when you're dealing with Chinese characters? And in terms of establishing the ordinary signification of a trademark consisting of a foreign word, what's important is the meaning conveyed by that foreign word uh, to those who will be concerned with the relevant goods. So here we have wine drinkers, but in particular, there might be Mandarin and Chinese speaking wine drinkers. And when you're assessing infringement, um, emphasis is placed on that meaning and pronunciation. And it's also you appear, you do have consideration into the visual and oral aspects, the appearance and sound, the same as we would when you're comparing Roman characters. And, and he did that in this case, and I'll take you through that in a moment. He also said, so there was trademark infringement, but also a claim for misleading and deceptive conduct. And he said, and he confirmed, and this is consistent with other case law, that you can have misleading and deceptive conduct arising in respect of a class of people within the market. And, and it was um, reasonable here, he was identifying who's, what's the market, it would be Chinese and Mandarin speakers, and, and who's the reasonable consumer within that market. So just because we are predominantly English speaking doesn't mean that you can't have a case for trademark infringement or ACL um, in, a, in a foreign language situation. So uh, there was an infringement finding under section 120. There was also an infringement finding under section 228. Now some people aren't familiar with section 228. It's actually a provision that says an infringement will be found if you apply the mark here in Australia with the intention of sending that good overseas. So here Penfolds was well, the infringing party was applying a mark to a wine made in Australia and then sending it into China um, and saying it was Ben Fu with this character mark. So that, that was the activity and it counts as an infringement here, even though the good will be sold overseas. So, um, sorry, I've clicked a few, I'll just go back. So looking at these marks, for those of you who don't speak Chinese or Mandarin, um, the first one is identical, Ben Fu. Second one is Ben Fu, but the last two character, characters um, stand for wine park or winery, for a very descriptive word. The next ones are the more common translation for winery. The following one has Australia at the front, winery at the end, and then the further one has um, Australia, and then written formally, then less formally than the word winery. So all of those, if you're a Chinese and Mandarin speaker, those words are very descriptive, and the word that really is distinguishing the um, wine on the infringing bottle is the mark Ben Fu. And then you might say, well, okay, I can understand how a Chinese character mark is identical uh, to the other Chinese character mark that Ben Folds was, um, had registered or South Corp brand had registered. And you may be able to see where the judge went because if it is read out loud orally, it would be pronounced Ben Fu. Uh, and so the judge, people can see, well, that's that's the same. I can see where the judge got there. And then Penfolds is one step different again. Um, but that's where um, the judge took into account that from a phonetic point of view, it's difficult for a Chinese person to exactly replicate the word Penfolds. And even if they saw the word Penfolds, they would call it Ben Fu. And on Google, if you typed the characters or Ben Fu, you, it would translate into Penfolds. So because of all of that evidence, he was able to um, make a finding that Penfolds was deceptively similar to these characters. So I think the takeaway message from this case is that one, you can enforce um, perhaps your mark against a Chinese character mark, so your Roman um, English word against a, a character mark if it is a translation. Uh, but similarly, if you are targeting the Chinese market or any other market that's foreign speaking, you may want to localise your brand and um, file registrations for the transliteration and also the Chinese characters. So the next case I wanted to talk about is Urban Alley. And Urban Alley is, um, it's quite a th few things in this case, but the reason why I wanted to focus on it today is because it's an example of um, a mark that lacks distinctiveness and how um, Urban Alley got themselves into trouble with this and some takeaway messages um, of what you can do if your mark is one that uh, doesn't have sufficient distinctiveness. This is becoming more common because of uh, marketing, just like to have less distinctive marks these days. I think that 
if it's less distinctive and it's more descriptive, then the consumer will know what the product is. And then lawyers who are trying to protect them say, no, we don't want that because we want something that's distinctive. So it is coming up more often, but let's go through what the issues are. So Urban Alley um, had its um, uh, sort of craft beer product. Uh, and originally it was on the shelf as the pictures displayed there and it's once bitter. And on the side, if you can see, um, there's really um, fine font down the bottom of the once bitter beer bottle that says Urban Ale. And on the side of the box, it says Urban Ale. And, the, and down the bottom of the packaging, it says Urban Ale as well. And that Urban Alley Brewery filed a trademark in, um, on the 14th of June, 2016, and subsequently got that registered. And they had commenced using the beer um, like this in May, 2016. And then uh, La Serene came along and um, started using what they had was Urban Pale. And I'll show you a picture in a moment, but they had Urban Pale on their brewery and Urban Alley said Urban Pale and Urban Ale is too similar and they pursued them for infringement. And La Serene commenced their use um, after the, the filing date of the registration. But as part of the proceedings and in order to get out of infringement, La Serene applied for the cancellation of the Urban Ale registration on the basis that the mark lacked distinctiveness and should never have been registered. And we're seeing this happen more often where um, cross claims are filed to attack the validity of a mark to try and get out of infringement. So this, um, I just wanted to show you this slide. It's um, So the proceedings, just the timeline, if I say that again, so Urban Ale started using in May 2016 and then they filed their trademark in June 2016. By that time they had about $10,000 worth of sales, not much, it had only been going for a month. Then Urban Pale started in around October 2016 with its Urban Pale and uh, proceedings were filed in February 2018. And then while those proceedings were on foot, some changes were made to the packaging and probably um, because of a legal advice, which is great because this is actually much better packaging in order to show use of Urban Ale as a trademark. So um, by the end of the financial year 2018, uh, Urban Alley had about $520,000 worth of sales, so not very much. Um, and in in the opposition, uh, sorry, in the cancellation proceedings, that was um, an issue that was discussed. And His Honour was having a look at some of the evidence that had been filed by both parties. And this press release came up and, it, and I've flagged it because it's a good example of maybe not what not to do. Um, if you have a mark that is lacking in distinctiveness, it's really important to try and make sure that you start um, using it as a trademark, as a source of origin and educating the consumer that you treat the mark as a trademark and that's how you want them to treat it. Um, this particular press release, release, it was probably, look, given that these guys had done very little sales, it probably went to all of 10 people and it was a bit harsh of Justice O'Brien to, you know, slap their wrist on this one. But um, it is an example of how they were probably not doing themselves any favours because they were calling the style of the beer um, urban ale. You can see there in the second line, but they were kind of ma matching it up with phrases such as Aussie golden ale, which is very descriptive. Golden ale is specifically um, describing the product. Um, Belgian blonde, not so much, but it, it is it is starting to um, water down their rights there. They would have been better if they had urban ale, TM, maybe they call it bold, maybe they change the font. So it's really important to um, just bear in mind how if you've got a mark that lacks distinctiveness, how the business is using that and when you have proceedings like this, what evidence you actually file, that it could, the other side put this in, but just be careful on what use is out there. So in this case, the evidence showed that the word urban had been used in connection with breweries and beer products for a considerable period of time. There was evidence filed um, by the other, by um, La Serene to show they had some uh, people who review beers and the like, and they were trying to show that at the time the, um, Urban Ale mark was filed, the, the, the mark lacked distinctiveness at that time. And Lasserine submitted that the ordinary signification of the words Urban Ale is to describe the ale made in an urban area um, for consumption by an urban audience. So they were saying that the word urban um, was a, describing a characteristic of the goods. Now, um, Justice 
O'Brien in this case, he found that the urban ale mark did not to any extent inherently adapt the mark to distinguish the beer. Now, I think that's a bit of a tough finding. Um, I think that most people probably would have said that urban ale has some distinctiveness, but not sufficient to be outright, outright registrable. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because urban and the characteristics, but the expert and both parties agreed um, that urban does not describe a characteristic of the good itself. And I think the trademarks office would hold that view too. And, and what urban describes is something like the area or the audience, but not the good itself. So when you're in going through the trademarks office, they do tend to make a distinction between that. So um, it, it's a fine distinction, but if you were talking about classes of goods and services, one, if you were brewing, brewing beer, urban would be dis, um, descriptive if you were because of the locality and what you were doing, but um, the goods itself, maybe not. Anyway, most people say that this is a bit of a harsh finding. Um, urban ale is not the same as the word soap or um, the word beer, which is completely descriptive. Nevertheless, that was a finding against them. The consequence of that finding is that um, if you have a finding that it's six, section 41.3, um, then you need to have evidence of use before your filing date of how the mark was used and that you can show that you have acquired a reputation and it has become, um, you, you have used it to distinguish your pro products and it has become distinctive of you. And that has to happen before the filing date. So before I said they only had about $10,000 worth of sales, they didn't have sufficient use. And in this case, the um, judge formed the view that the mark should be canceled, the registered mark should be canceled. Um, and when he was looking at whether or not there was a misleading deceptive conduct, an ACL type claim, he was looking at all of the evidence, but still even up um, to the, uh, the, the evidence that was filed, there was only 520,000 dollars worth of sales in financial year 2018, so not enough. So it, it's a bit of a tough um, tough finding, but even if his honour had gone the way that I think most people would think that this mark has some, some ability to distinguish, but um, not enough to be inherently adapted, uh, there was still insufficient evidence, in my view, uh, that um, would have allowed the, the, um, the test to be met. Um, whether the judge could have or ought to have exercised discretion not to remove it, um, that's another debate. But in this case, um, the finding was that it was there was not sufficient evidence, it lacked distinctiveness and it was cancelled. Um, so the judge went on, so that meant that they, they didn't have a registration to pursue infringement with, there can't be an infringement under the Trademarks Act. But the judge did go on to consider whether the urban pale um, can it was an infringement because uh, he, he said, look, if I'm wrong and, and it comes back on, on appeal, I need to consider this question of trademark use. Now, I, I think his finding was that the use of urban pale in this context on this can, the way it is there with the sort of lockup format with urban pale with by La Serene underneath and some nice graphics around it, his finding was that urban pale was not trademark use. Now, I think that his finding there is inconsistent with previous case law, and I'll take you to one that Justice Burley went through is quite a good case. Um, the factors that led Justice O'Brien to this conclusion was that he, he had formed in his view that urban ale and urban pale were overwhelmingly descriptive. So that was a factor that was really weighing on his mind. Another thing that he took into account was some of the let's, expert with inverted commas around it, evidence from the pe people that wrote in magazines reviewing craft beers. And uh, normally um, the judges in the federal court, the IP judges in the federal court will not take expert evidence there. They'll make view themselves. So it was interesting that Justice O'Brien took that into account, but Justice O'Brien doesn't do IP uh, very often at all. Um, he's more, does a different type of law, but he, he's done, he was considering this and he said, oh, he found them overwhelmingly descriptive. He took into account what the expert was saying and he didn't think, he also took into account that by La Serene was written down the bottom and he said, well, it's got by La Serene, La Serene there, so I think urban pale will not be seen as a mark. And I, I think that if you have this situation, probably don't rely on this case um, you know, Justice O'Brien was looking at this after he'd made his original finding. Um, I would probably go to 
Justice Burley's findings in Bohemia Crystal and Host Corporation, that case about two years ago. And for those of you who came to our Brisbane Breakfast Forum, you might have might know a little bit about this case already. Um, and it, it, in this case, Justice Burley goes through a lot of the previous case law and, and breaks down in detail what is and is not trademark use. And I think it's quite um, good to be aware of. So this one um, was that there was a finding as well that the word bohemia was to do with a location. And so it was lacking in distinctiveness. And when Justice Burley was looking at this, you have the one on the um, right hand side, which is in a lockup format with um, crystal of distinction underneath and a, a logo at the top, they call that the 701 mark. The competitor or the infringing um, product is on the right hand side and it's banquet by, um, I think it's crystal, crystal by Bohemia. And Justice Burley, he, he had a close look at how this is happening and, and this case came out um, as in the course of the proceedings for the Urban Alley case and may well have been why the, pa the packaging was changed in the course of the Urban Alley case. So um, Justice Burley said at 196, he said, you know, we're, we're looking at that blue package, you've got the 701 mark, the logo up the top, the word Bohemia, crystal of distinction, et cetera, et cetera. And the problem with looking at that is that you can't just look at the word Bohemia in isolation, it's a lockup, and so it, um, it causes some ambiguity about what mark is actually being used and whether you can say that the word Bohemia on its own has acquired distinctiveness. So if you have got a um, mark that lacks distinctiveness and you're trying to use it, the best thing to use to do is use it in isolation the way the second version of the Urban Owl case was doing it. Justice Burley also went on and, and talked about how um, the logos were presented and the use of Bohemia was presented. And in this case, it was interesting because it was crystal by Bohemia, similar to we had by La Serene in um, Urban Alley case, but um, consistent with the previous case law, Justice Burley made it very clear that the use of one obvious trademark, the word banquet, does not preclude the finding that there's another trademark. So when um, Justice O'Brien was looking at his pale ale, uh, urban ale, pale La Serene beer can, just because he found a finding that La Serene was a trademark doesn't mean that um, the other, there couldn't also be a finding that Urban Pale was a trademark. Now, I'm of the view that Urban Pale was being used in, um, you know, it's very prominent, it was there to um, attract the consumer's con um, attention. And I'm, I think he should have gone with the finding that it is trademark use, but because he had already found that it was um, too descriptive that basically nobody had rights in it, everybody was using it. So I know, um, I'll just swap over to Jack soon, I just want to give you some takeaway messages um, as to what you can do in practice to help avoid these issues. So firstly, if you're at the Trademarks Office, this is section 5.5 from the manual um, and some of the factors that the Trademarks Office look into. So are you, as a uh, person that owns a mark, are you treating it as a, a badge of origin? And so where we had that press release, don't do things like that. Try to use it clearly as, a, as a, um, a mark. Use it on the side, so those cans that we looked at, the second version of the cans where it had the brand down the side, it was very prominent use of urban ale. That's what you're striving for. Um, other things to be th thinking of is if you've got proceedings, opposition proceedings on foot, or if you're in court and you have cancellation um, proceedings, you need to be getting as much volume of evidence as you can into the proceedings so that you can demonstrate that the mark has acquired distinctiveness and um, try to get the best examples possible where the mark is used on its own because you do have the ambiguity where the mark is um, in, in a composite format. Um, in particular, try to, if you're still using a mark, try to put your TM symbol, try to use it um, with capitals or bold or font to try and distinguish it. And um, just be aware that it is more common now for people to attack the validity of mark and that this could come up. So if you're going to start proceedings, that somebody could challenge you and you'll need to be there ready with your um, evidence. So um, I, that's all I wanna say on those items there. I'll hand over to Jack now and he'll be um, joining us today to talk about protecting non-traditional signs. Um, so I'll take it over to Jack. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, 
Yeah, so today I'll be uh, speaking about non-traditional signs um, and trademarks. Um, and I think these types of uh, marks and signs are increasing in popularity as companies are looking uh, to be more creative in terms of developing distinctive branding um, and their IP um, to distinguish themselves from, um, from competitors. Um, it's important to just consider all the options in terms of how they protect these distinctive um, branding elements. Um, yeah, so today I'll be focusing mainly on, I'll, I'll bring up the definition of sign and trademark shortly, but I'll be focusing mainly on sound, shape, colour and movement marks. Um, given these aspects of branding are becoming more important, um, given the rise of uh, in marketing via social media, um, particularly Instagram, Snapchat, Snapchat um, TikTok, uh, and even the increase in popularity of um, podcasts. Um, and I guess uh, brand owners are creating their own videos um, and content to engage more directly with consumers. Um, and obviously these copper marks are still important to, to more traditional advertising such as print, TV and radio. Um, so I think the purpose of my talk today really is to encourage brand owners to um, think about how they intend to protect their branding um, and the options they have to protect their uh, you know, non-traditional signs. Um, so I have there the definition of trademark and sign from the Trademarks Act. Um, so you see there a sign includes a number of things and I've highlighted um, and it also covers movement, hologram marks, things like that. Um, and a trademark is a sign that's used or intended to be used to distinguish goods or services dealt with um, in the course of trade from other people, um, from other traders. Um, so I've put a few pictures there. The first one is obviously, uh, if you're a racing fan, you know that's black caviar. Um, and there's about 328 registrations for colour marks in Australia at the moment. Uh, the second picture is the Coca-Cola bottle. That's a shape mark, it's quite famous. Um, and there's about a bit over 1,000 trademark um, shape registrations in Australia. The third is a sound, you can't, it's a bit difficult to see that, but it's the sheet music for Intel Corporation. Um, uh, so we'll discuss that a little bit later. There's 61 registrations for sound in Australia. Um, and the fourth is a uh, is Toyota, um, it's a movement mark. So there's about 81 registrations in Australia. Um, so basically today I'm going to go through sound um, and you can also protect it by way of copyright um, and I'll do that for the for the other four um, signs that I've identified as well. Um, so sound and music is obviously a quite important and memorable um, aspect of branding. Um, I guess it went out of fashion a little bit um, but as I as I mentioned it's becoming more popular and more important with social media um, and apps like TikTok um, which are based around short catchy videos um, and even podcasts as I mentioned earlier there's usually a distinctive um, hook at the start or end of podcasts um, and things like that just so the consumer recognizes when it's um, uh, when the when the podcast or who, who's produced the podcast or who's produced the video um, so if you're using it as a badge of origin which I would suggest most of the time um, sound marks are, sound, sounds are used as a badge of origin so that people associate that sound with your brand. Um, you can file it, um, you can obtain a trademark registration. Um, and I think they would unlikely to receive a section 41 distinctiveness objection um, unless it's very descriptive. Um, so something like a you know, sound of a car engine for a, a car wouldn't be registrable but otherwise I think they're generally distinctive. Um, and they can also protect some sounds that, um, or music that may not be protected by copyright. So, um, so if copyright to subsist, it must be sufficiently original. It doesn't have to be overly um, innovative. Sorry. It doesn't have to be overly innovative or artistic, but um, it does have to be attributable to the author's skill and labor. Um, so uh, I think arguably there, is, there are some benefits of seeking trademark registration 
um, for sound marks. Um, and the, one of those might be that the short sounds or musical compositions that may not attract copyright protection can still be used as a trademark and registered and protected. So an example I thought of was um, compare the market uh, has a sound registration for the way the meerkat says simples. Um, that probably wouldn't attra attract copyright protection, but it is quite distinctive. Um, even the Intel one that I mentioned earlier, there's actually only four or five notes in that. I think probably copyright would subsist, but I think obtaining a trademark registration uh, would minimise the risk of, I guess, having an argument about that if you were looking to enforce it. Um, trademark registration as well, you don't, you don't need to prove copyright ownership, um, which can sometimes be difficult. Um, and arguably the test, I think, for trademark infringement um, being uh, whether it's substantially identical or deceptively similar um, will catch a broader range of conduct than um, the test for copyright infringement, which is a substantial reproduction. Uh, there's no cases on that at this stage, um, but I guess even if I'm wrong on that, there's just another layer of uh, protection there uh, for you to consider. Um, so onto shape marks, if you have a particular shape um, feature that consumers recognise as a source of origin and as a trademark, you can uh, register it as a trademark. Um, so obviously examples of the Coca-Cola bottle, um, it's well known. Um, and there's Toblerone, the um, chocolate packaging shape. Um, I think one issue with trademark, uh, shape trademarks is they potentially are more likely to receive a distinctiveness objection. Um, obviously it depends what the shape is, but you may need to provide evidence of use. Um, and that'll need to show that you have promoted your, uh, the shape as a trademark um, and that consumers have come to recognise it as a, as a trademark. Um, I'll discuss a little bit later in, in terms of how you can do that, uh, how you can demonstrate that and how you should use your shape as a trademark. Um, you can also register a shape as a, as a design. Uh, you can also obtain a design registration. So that'll protect the overall appearance of the product. Um, however, design protection, you, you cannot um, uh, make the design publicly available before filing the um, application for a design. Um, and design protection only lasts 10 years. There's also a two-step process. So you um, go through a formalities um, examination initially and you can obtain a registration. But then you, if you would like to enforce it, um, you need to have the design registration examined and certified before you can enforce it against um, any third party. But I guess the, just having the design registration number on packaging and in marketing material can sometimes deter infringers on its own. Um, so an option uh, is to, if, if, if your mark, if your shape isn't uh, distinctive before you start using it, um, it's obtain design registration initially before you've made it publicly available um, and then perhaps uh, try for a shape um, registration, trademark registration uh, at a later date once you've used it for a few years and that way you'll be able to uh, maintain protection um, after the 10 years for the, once uh, the design expires because you can continue to renew a trademark um, every 10, 10 years basically indefinitely. Um, so then there's also colour and movement marks. So really just raising these so um, brand owners are aware of them. Um, uh, issues with a colour mark is uh, they can be, it, it, it can be uh, more likely to receive a distinctiveness objection, particularly if it's one colour. Um, yeah, and you need to show clearly again that uh, consumers recognise it as a trademark. Um, uh, so and a colour, I've just listed three, three matters there. If there's a generally accepted meaning in relation to the goods. Um, if there's, so I guess, um, orange in relation to safety 
um, or red in relation to uh, you know fire extinguishers or something like that. Um, it's a natural colour of the goods, um, is one for which there's a competitive need in the industry. Um, in terms of movement marks, there's Toyota um, and Jetstar, and they use them really well in terms of, uh, they use them at the end of um, promotional material um, on their own without other branding. Um, and I think consumers have come to recognise the those jumps um, as distinctive of um, Toyota and Jetstar. Um, but then you can also have movement marks for how the logo is presented. Um, so Snooze has a movement mark and it starts with the, the O's in the middle are presented uh, like eyes and then uh, they're blinking a few times and then uh, Snooze is spelt around it. So that's also an example of a movement mark. Um, alternatives to protecting those colour and movement marks would be passing off. You need to establish three elements being um, a reputation, uh, there's been a misrepresentation and then there's um, you've suffered damage as a result um, and then there's also uh, misleading and deceptive conduct in contravention of the Australian consumer law. Arguably can be more difficult to establish um, because of the reputation element that you need to um, establish as against a trademark registration where you can just uh, point to the trademark registration number. Um, so these are just some tips similar to um, Kelly's tips earlier um, in terms of using your non-traditional signs as a trademark. Um, so nearly, yeah, you, you clearly uh, need to promote the sign as a trademark. Um, so you need to be consistent with the use of the mark. So if you're using a, a colour mark, for example, um, be consistent with the shade of the colour. Um, uh, you need to uh, demonstrate that it's use, used independently of the house brand, so away from your word and logo marks. And as I touched on with Telstra and, uh, sorry, Toyota uh, and Jetstar, they do that quite well with their movement marks. Um, you'll often see just the jump and then the, the brand might come in later. Um, for shape and colour marks, uh, refer specifically to the um, to the shape of the colour in respect of the goods. Um, so include words like look for the star shaped box or you know uh, look for the attractive colours unusual shape. Um, you know that might seem a little bit artificial, but it's I think it's good practice, um, especially when you first start using the marks. Um, and it's a good cue for consumers. Um, and also if you ever need to enforce your mark or um, establish evidence of use or a reputation, then those are the kind of cues that uh, the decision maker will be looking for. Um, and again, distinguish it from their surrounding advertising. So whether it's text, just make it more prominent. Um, if it's a video, as I said with um, Toyota, um, it's on its own. The sound shouldn't be, uh, I guess, mixed up with other sounds, um, should be on its own. Um, and practical tips, just um, as I said earlier, the, the purpose of this was to um, encourage brand owners to think about how they intend to protect their um, non-traditional signs um, as soon as they develop the signs. Um, and if you're looking for a shape or a design, then it'll be before you um, launch, launch the, um, the sign in the market. So if you intended to use it as a trademark, there's three tips there. Consider undertaking clearance searches of the trademark register and common law um, to ensure you're not, um, to ensure you're not uh, infringing other parties' rights. Um, collect evidence of use of the trademark from the, um, from the first use um, and collect evidence of consumers recognising the sign as a trademark. So that might be things like um, social media, um, comments or other reviews from consumers that you might come across um, kind of recognising the shape or the colour or the sound as a trademark. Um, and establish internal guidelines for how the sign is to be used um, as um, I discussed in the earlier slide. Um, so I'll pass on to Shannon and she'll be discussing the um, Australian New Zealand trademark practice.
Hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Shannon Fati. Um, I'm a registered trademark attorney and I um, practice in, in Australia and New Zealand and also internationally as Kelly mentioned before. And today I'm going to talk about the primary differences or some of the primary differences um, between Australian and New Zealand trademark prosecution and um, in the opposite opposition procedure as well. Uh, I mean, the country, like many aspects of life between New Zealand and Australia, it's um, fairly aligned, but there are some unique differences which um, it's important to bear in mind, um, particularly if you've got a client that's looking to apply a similar strategy across both uh, countries. Uh, so to deal firstly with the distinctiveness um, provisions in Australia and New Zealand, the legislation itself is um, quite different. So in Australia, as many will know, uh, there's two uh, criteria. The first is Section 41.3, where a trademark can't be uh, registered um, where it's not to any extent inherently adapted to distinguish. So these are these purely descriptive marks. Um, the second ground is Section 41.4, where a trademark is to some extent um, inherently adapted to distinguish, but not um, sufficiently enough to be registered um, on face value. So in comparison to the New Zealand legislation, there's potentially four grounds in which uh, you can get an objection. Um, based on distinctiveness. The first is Section 181A, um, a sign that is on a trademark. It's not really often raised um, in a practical sense. Um, I think uh, from my days when I was an examiner at IPONS, I think I recall it only really arising uh, where perhaps there was a self-applicant who may have written some really long-winded description of a trademark and what it does, um, where it's just obvious that that's not the intended sign. The Section 181B and C grounds, um, the, they've been split up. So the 181B ground relates to trademarks that have no distinctive character. So this isn't necessarily trademarks that describe a characteristic of the goods and services. It's more something that's just um, may not be seen as a trademark. So the example given in the uh, one of the examples given in the examiner guidelines is um, treat for dessert sauces um, that came from the British sugar test. Uh, British sugar uh, case and um, not not descriptive in any way of dessert sources, but may not necessarily be seen as um, descriptive in the ordinary sense. So the 181C ground deals with um, marks that are predominantly descriptive of some function or characteristic of the um, goods and services. So traditionally, if you're going to get a section 181C, um, it naturally follows that you may get that you will get a section 181B that the trademark is non-distinctive as well. But you won't necessarily get an 181C objection where a, a B objection has been raised. So they're not uh, mutually exclusive. So there is a variation between um, when those two provisions may be raised. And New Zealand also has this additional ground relating to trademarks that have become customary in trade. So ordinarily, you don't really see objections like uh, relating to customary in trade um, come up during examination because it does require a degree of uh, knowledge of the trade, which traditionally would come with reviewing evidence. So um, it's it's more something that you might see in an opposition, for example, as opposed to being raised during the examination process. So another key thing to bear in mind in New Zealand is that the evidence requirements are a lot more stringent than what you might see in Australia. So the uh, New Zealand only considers evidence which has is dated post filing date. So that's consistent with what you might see under the section 41.3 ground, which um, only only allows the examiner to consider the the post the pre-filing date evidence, whereas the section 141.4 ground in Australia allows for intended use and use which is dated um, 
after the priority dates. So moving on to uh, the similar uh, identifying identical or similar trademarks, um, the provisions in New Zealand and Australia are quite similar in the sense that um, Australia talks about substantially identical marks on the register, which may prevent registration or deceptively similar trademarks. New Zealand uses similar wording. Um, there's a provision relating to identical marks, so that's slightly narrower than the wording um, in Australia um, for a, an objection to be raised on the basis of an identical mark on the register it really does have to be identical um, and the it, it's a similar consideration between the countries but again New Zealand has this additional um, provision relating to um, well-known trademarks so um, if if there's the applied for mark um, is identical or similar to a trademark that's well known and the examiner considers that it would um, indicate a connection in the course of trade um, with the owner of that well known mark and that would likely prejudice the interests of that owner, um, an objection can be raised. And the important thing here is that the goods and services of the applied for mark don't need to be the same as what um, the the prior mark is well known for. Um, but again, in, in practice, this objection um, doesn't often crop up during examination. It's more of an opposition ground um, simply because the examiner would need um, some understanding or knowledge of how the trade, the, how the prior mark is well known, which um, requires evidence of use. So the evidence requirements as well um, under these grounds in Australia and New Zealand do reflect a difference in, um, in, in what is considered. So in Australia, you can file evidence to get past the prior mark objection based on honest and concurrent use and prior and continuous use. But New Zealand doesn't allow for prior and continuous use. So if you're thinking about going into the New Zealand market and your clearance searches indicate that there is a prior mark on the register, um, if you're wanting to rely on evidence of use to overcome that objection, you really need to consider um, prior to filing whether your use in New Zealand would satisfy the honest and concurrent use um, requirements. Because um, I mean, if you've if you've only got one or two years use in New Zealand um, prior to the filing date, um, it, it may not be enough to get you through. So also unique to the um, New Zealand examination process is the consideration of trademarks that have Māori words or images in them. So um, the idea behind this is that um, the trademark office wants to consider whether trademarks that do have these words or images in, in them, whether they'd be deemed to be offensive to the Māori community. So there's actually a special trademark status for these marks. So when a trademark is indexed on the register, you'd ordinarily see, see it as uh, identified as a word or a logo mark, for example. But these trademarks have a special status called a Māori trademark type and um, that allows you to also be able to search them on the register. Uh, New Zealand also uses the Vienna classification system for images, um, so that involves a number of, um, I guess, codes um, relating to particular um, images or shapes and there actually are special uh, Vienna, dis Vienna descriptors for New Zealand relating to common um, things like, say, for example, the moko, which is the facial uh, tattooing, um, or New Zealand-specific flora and fauna. So if your trademark is deemed to be a Māori trademark, um, it will go to the Māori Advisory Committee, who will decide whether your trademark is likely um, to cause offence. And that committee is made up of a number of um, scholars or people with background, uh, you know, sufficient background in um, the Māori language and customs um, who are qualified to actually make that assessment. So some words and images won't be problematic. Um, for example, 
the word Kiwi, it's so well known. Um, it's generally not seen as problematic or the koru image, which is the um, fern spiral image that you often see um, in different ways in New Zealand. So some example, I've just got some examples below from the examiner's manual um, for trademarks, which may have, um, which I think actually were previously registered many years ago, but probably wouldn't meet the um, threshold now to get through. A particular red flags are trademarks that have Maori words or images and that are used or applied on um, cigarettes or alcohol. But as you can see, um, you know, any representation of, say, historic um, figureheads or chiefs um, or any use on cigarettes um, will, will be scrutinised um, quite heavily. So what about Australia? Um, currently, there's no specific provisions relating to um, trademarks that have Indigenous words or symbols. Um, there is a consideration, um, a general consideration that that will be the examiner will take into account as to whether something is offensive, but that's quite a high um, threshold um, in the ordinary sense, and it's not necessarily specific to looking at it from um, what's culturally offensive, which um, you know may not necessarily meet those high. Um, tests or the high general offensiveness tests in an ordinary sense. Um, so I'm not going to go into to any too much detail about the Burraby case, but um, this case dealt with the uh, the koala mascot from the Commonwealth Games in 2018 in the Gold Coast. Um, and this specifically dealt with um, whether there, whether there is a requirement to actually consult with Indigenous communities if you are actually using um, a, a trademark that has got Indigenous um, words or images in it. And uh, it, the delegate in that case um, said that there's, when, when filing a trademark application, there is no requirement for consultation. So um, I guess the, the provisions in New Zealand um, is almost like a safeguard in a sense um, or, or an additional step to make sure that this, this aspect is actually given due consideration um, at some point in the process. So um, if you're interested in reading up about the Burraby case, I wrote an article on it um, a few years back and I'd be happy to send that to you if, if you want to have a read. Um, so, sorry, um, for the oppositions, I'm not really going to deal with the grounds specifically. Um, I just wanted to touch on the difference in the extension of time provisions between the countries. Uh, so, in New Zealand, there is the the option of requesting a one month extension of um, extension to file a notice of opposition, um, and this can be extended for a further two months with the consent of the applicant. So um, that would normally arise if the parties are negotiating some kind of resolution. And during the opposition process, um, it's fairly easy to get at least one month, one three month extension to file your evidence. Um, but, out, but past that period, um, you really need to be showing um, exceptional circumstances to justify the extension. And of course, there's the provisions to allow the parties to halt the proceedings. But I think this is quite practical, um, a, a quite a practical approach in terms of letting parties have some additional time to file the opposition documents, um, because I think it it does save the unnecessary expense that many parties experience in Australia with having to pay the official fee and prepare their notice of intention to oppose and statement of grounds and particulars. And I think it can take some pressure off the opposition process. Um, where there's actually reasonable prospects that the parties can resolve this um, fairly quickly. So in Australia, the raising the bar amendments in 2012 really tied in the screws on what um, on when you can get extensions of time in oppositions. Um, if you want to request an extension, um, there's two possible grounds. Um, the first is that you make all you have to show that you've made all reasonable efforts um, to comply with the deadline. And in addition to that, you also have to show that despite not being able to meet the deadline, you've still acted prom promptly and diligently. 
Um, or you need to be able to show exceptional circumstances. So that may be um, circumstances that arose that were outside, beyond your control, or that prevented you from meeting um, the deadline or an error or omission, for example. So in practice, um, my advice is always to clients to, where possible, avoid relying on extensions of time um, because they, it, they can be very difficult to get and um, often you can get quite inconsistent outcomes from the trademarks office. Um, one thing to bear in mind as well, um, the Trek Bicycle and Red Hawk case um, made it clear that you can't, uh, uh, time spent in settlement discussions doesn't justify an extension of time. So ordinarily, the parties might enter into a calling off period, but if that's not available, then um, whilst irrespective of what's happening in the settlement negotiations, you do still need to be um, preparing your evidence of use um, with the intention of being ready to file it um, if you need to in due course. Um, another couple of key things between Australia and New Zealand oppositions, um, the evidence in Australia only needs to be submitted in a declaration form, so there's no legalisation requirements. Um, and if it's appealed, then it um, is a de novo appeal, so you can resubmit your evidence. But in New Zealand, it has to be in the form of a statutory declaration. And it must meet the High Court standards. Um, and that's because if you are appealing, you need to rely on the same evidence that was put forward um, before the Trademarks Office. So sometimes if you know that there's going to definitely be an appeal, um, it's definitely a good idea to get a barrister involved quite early in those proceedings. Um, for non-use proceedings, I'm not really, I'm going to focus mainly on um, the differences where use can't be shown or there's, it can't be shown for all goods and services. So in Australia, um, you may be able to claim that there was an obstacle to use, but this needs to be of a trading nature. So a good example of this is um, pharmaceuticals, um, you've been prevented from using the trademark due to holdups in the regulation process. Um, outside of that though, the registrar has a really broad discretion to maintain a registration um, where it's reasonable to do so irrespective of any use made. So um, it doesn't require exceptional circumstances, um, but some factors may be that there was no abandonment of a trademark. There might be a residual reputa reputation that the um, trademark owner, you know, feels that um, another party might take advantage of that um, for their own benefit. And even use outside of the three year period will be considered, um, but you need to really show in that case that it's it's in good faith and that they're genuine sales and not just um, to defeat the removal um, action. So this decision was released um, actually last month and I thought it was just quite interesting because it talked to um, it the trademark owner was able to show um, use on protective goods in class 28 for martial arts only. Um, and the removal applicant wanted the registrar to actually exclude protective gear for lacrosse and hockey equipment, um, given the evidence indicated that the physical properties of those two goods were quite different. But the delegate didn't find that that was acceptable because it was would create too much of a fastidious distinction between them and considered the commercial realities that these types of goods are often sold in the same outlets. Um, for example, at Rebel Sport, where a consumer may go in and, and encounter both lots of goods. So there was a, a likelihood of confusion there. So um, the delegate removed gymnastic and sporting equipments, broad items like that, but exercised discretion to retain protective items quite generally, um, which would have prevented the removal applicant from getting their trademark through. Um, and I'll just quickly run through these slides just because we're running out of time. Um, for the difference in New Zealand, um, you can show special circumstances to maintain um, your registration, but um, 
it needs to be outside of the control of the owner and but it doesn't need to be um, trade related so a good decision there which was recently um, a, an appeal to the high court was the Fokker brothers case um, which is worth having a look at um, but critically New Zealand has a use it or lose it approach there's no discretion for the commissioner to maintain a registration where there's no use um, aside from the fact of these special circumstances um, so I'll just move on to my last slide, um, just touching on invalidity in New Zealand and Australia. So Australia allows for revocation of a trademark within um, 12 months of registration, um, but there really needs to be a clear sign that there was an error or omission or omission which led to the registration. Um, and even if you can satisfy that, um, it's also got to be reasonable. So if the trademark owner has relied on the registrar's decision to grant registration and invested a significant amount of money, it may not be reasonable to revoke that registration. So it's very rarely um, used. Um, outside of that 12 month period, you need to go through um, the court system. Um, in contrast in New Zealand, um, you can actually bring an invalidity action at any time on any of the opposition grounds um, and that's heard before IPONS. Um, so obviously the costs and the um, time frames involved there are significantly different to what you would experience in Australia. Um, so sorry to rush through those last few slides, um, but that's the end of my presentation. We're happy to take any questions. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shannon uh, and Kelly uh, and Jack for running through your presentations. Um, in terms of uh, questions, um, a question from uh, Mark Pullen um, for Kelly. Uh, so Kelly, might the urban alley decision have been different if the word urban had been larger than the word pale uh, and perhaps more separated from the word pale? Uh, yes, so I think the analysis, the second part of the analysis, I think the decision would stay, meaning that the, the mark for urban ale would be cancelled. But in, in relation to the trademark infringement question, um, where we had that blue can, um, I think that that is a good point. If, if they'd put um, maybe urban more prominently and pale in, in lower letters underneath it, then it might have begged the question, what are they trying to do with the word urban um, and are they trying to make it stand out even more than something else in a way that a trademark would be? So I think it would have asked the question. The other thing was that urban was found to be to do with, um, you know, maybe um, metropolitan areas and maybe for metropolitan uh, metropolitan audiences. Um, but it didn't. The, the branding on that blue can was actually farmhouse, urban, pale, la serene. So I, I thought the judge could have. It could have been a line of inquiry around why you would use urban descriptively when you uh, have got a brand farmhouse at the top. Farmhouse and urban didn't seem to sit um, together. Anyway, I think that is a good point. Had it have been on separate lines, perhaps the finding as to whether it was trademark use could have been different. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, I'm just putting the uh, contact details uh, back up on your screens uh, just so that you can uh, take down any notes and, and note these down in case you'd like to uh, ask any further questions to the uh, presenters. Uh, and we've had a number of questions uh, from a few individuals uh, and we've noted those and we'll get back in touch with you uh, as well. Um, I just wanted to, I guess, um, finish by just letting everybody know that there's a, another webinar that uh, Griffith Hack will be doing next week uh, on improving collaboration between universities, research, Institutes, uh, so research institutes, startups, and SMEs next Thursday, um, and you can find the details uh, on the website. And I will uh, give you back to Kelly just uh, to uh, thank everybody and uh, wrap up. Thanks, everybody. It was um, good for you to join us, and we will have another uh, trademark um, themed presentation in about six six weeks from now. Cool. Thank you all.